Today we have probably the, the most important of the informational presentations that we're doing. Um, we will be covering really the, the, the rules of the game, if you will. Um, there's been a lot of talk at past board meetings about um, GHG, VMT, a lot of different things about electric vehicles, for instance. And what we've assembled today for you is a panel that will be able to answer the questions directly in terms of what standards is SANDAG held to? What is it that we actually have to do and, and how can we meet those goals? Um, time permitting, I will give a, sh a brief overview of modeling and how modeling then works to make sure that these policies are uh, taken into account and that, that we're meeting our goals. And then um, later at a future transportation committee meeting, we'll be going into deep dive on modeling as deep as you want to go with, with all of the, the nitty gritty about, about how it works. But with me today, I have Kate Gordon, who is appointed by the director of the governor's office of planning and research. And she's a senior advisor to Governor Newsom on climate change, and she is also um, working on the long-range plans. Dr. Jennifer Gress is the chief of the Sustainability Transportation Communities Division of the California Air Resources Board. Uh, she's served as a legislative director for California Air Resources Board and works as a, a consultant to the Senate Transportation and Housing Committee. And we also have Ellen Greenberg, who was appointed uh, as the California Department of Transportation Deputy Director for Sustainability by uh, Governor Jerry Brown. And uh, she's currently working on leading the Caltrans effort to implement SB 743, sorry. And with that, I will hand it over to Kate to do her presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Chair Voss and Vice Chair Blake Spirit. Thanks for having us here today. Let's hope this works. Ooh, look at that. Um, always amazing when that actually works. Uh, so as you heard, I am uh, the director of the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. We're an uh, agency located in the Governor's Office that's responsible for long-range planning for the state, um, and particularly for the Governor and Cabinet. I also chair the Strategic Growth Council, which many of you know because there are a number of uh, affordable housing sustainable communities projects in this region. Um, and I also am the governor's senior advisor on, on climate, as well as working with our business and economic development department on something we're calling Regions Rise, which is an effort to do economic development across the inland and Central Valley parts of the state. Um, OPR, in particular, is the central hub of the state for uh, most land use planning conversations, including climate resilience, which obviously is very interconnected with land, land use and planning. We do the general plan guidelines. We do the CEQA guidelines. We run the military councils, so we work um, in this region quite a lot with military bases on land use issues and also offshore uh, military um, issues like offshore wind. So we're very engaged uh, in this region and across the state on those issues. And um, because of that, we spend a lot of time thinking about climate change. Uh, back, you know, I would say in the last administration and actually just in general um, on the issue of climate in, in this country and other countries, we've spent a lot of time thinking about climate change as a is just about emissions reduction and mostly about renewable energy, honestly, and about energy efficiency and about wind and so you see a lot of wind and solar pictures. Uh, when the governor started his um, term, the first week of his term, um, you know, the first week PG&E went bankrupt uh, because of climate emergencies and then the ratings agencies downgraded all three of our utilities. Um, this is a stark issue in California. Obviously the fires really <clears throat> bring home we also need to think about the current impacts of climate change from the past uh, several decades of emissions that we're experiencing as a state today. And you know that as regional planners, and we know that as state planners. These things are real, and they're hitting us now, and they're impacts that we're dealing with fiscally, and they're impacts we need to realize. Extreme heat, uh, flooding, drought. We even have glacial melt in parts of the state. So we really have everything um, in the state, and that means we need to take a very integrated approach. You here, I know the Del Mar, Mar Bluffs issue is a, a key example of how this is playing out. The interaction between your transportation infrastructure, climate impacts, your budget, the state budget, this plays out um, every region of the state on a daily basis. Climate is also not just a, uh, a, an impacts issue, it's also a housing issue. Um, housing affordability is integrally related to the climate crisis in California, and we'll all be talking about, about that relationship. But the reality is that, I, you all know, the San Diego region just hit an all-time high median house price of, of 594000 
dollars, and that's twice the national average. Um, what happens when places are unaffordable in California, when job centers are unaffordable, is that people are pushed further and further and further out from those job centers to afford housing. Metro areas expand. We expand into other municipal areas. We go across boundaries, and it creates some of the transportation impacts that we've been talking about. It also obviously creates development in or continues development in areas that are just right at that inflection point with the climate resilience issues I just talked about. It creates the need for hardening housing, shoring up housing, investing in making sure that our residents are safe. So there's all of these intersections with housing and with our growth um, agenda, including, of course, transportation. I know that unlike a lot of other parts of the state that the super commuter issue is not as big of an issue here, which I know it's an issue, but it's not where it is in the Bay Area or in Los Angeles, but it is certainly growing as an issue um, and, in, in, and is something that, that we'll all be talking a lot about because um, it really goes beyond the fact that these individual vehicles are emitting uh, carbon and that's part of our larger climate conversation. It goes to what is our quality of life? What are our land use patterns? How are those land use patterns contributing to both those climate crises that we're seeing day to day in terms of impact and contributing to continued emissions that are going to continue those crises in the future. So I know my co-panelists will go into much more detail on these things, but just as an overview, uh, why do we care so much about transportation? Uh, transportation in the climate context, 41% of our overall emissions picture. Um, it is, when I started my job, the governor said to me, um, you know, go and look at all the goals we've set and all the laws we've put in place, the, the, the legislation, the executive orders, the PUC, the CEC regulations, and tell me what our goals are and what we've said we're going to do and where are we on meeting them. And we're doing really well on some of them. We're doing really well on electricity, um, for instance. Transportation is going up year by year in terms of emissions. A large percentage of that, a big part of it is freight and freight mobility, and a big part of it is single occupancy drivers and commutes. Um, that is something we, we have got to get our heads around. To add to this picture, if you actually add in supply, um, uh, oil and gas uh, production and refining, it's about 51% of this picture. And that's important because we use 100% of what we produce in California. So the demand and supply relationship is really strong uh, when it comes to oil and gas in, in this state. Um, I'm sure Jen will talk more about this, but uh, the CARB was asked by the legislature to do a review of its current policies um, on uh, cap and trade policies to see sort of where we're making progress. Are we achieving particularly our sustainable community strategies? And what the SB 150 report came out with um, was really the answer is really no. And the main thing to get away from, get out of this um, report is that we cannot solve the transportation slice of this puzzle by replacing every one of those cars on my earlier slide with an electric vehicle. If we replace every one of those cars with an electric vehicle, we get, the, we get part of the way there. But we still have the commute time. We still have, first of all, we have, slow, we have a slow conversion rate. California, unlike my home state of Wisconsin, our cars don't rust out. People keep them for a really long time. We have a very, very long ownership period for cars. So we don't replace them very quickly. A lot of folks in the state can't afford new vehicles. And so we have sort of a slower turnover rate than we would like to see. But beyond that, We've got people driving multiple hours. We've got um, people moving further and further out, which has consequences to land and land conversion, which also affect our climate picture. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But the key point of SB 150 cannot do this with electrification alone. Although it's a critical part of the strategy, we must look at land use strategies to meet our climate laws that have been put in place by this guy, former Governor Jerry Brown. Um, Governor Brown was incredibly uh, effective in leading on, um, you know, taking a global leadership position on climate change, which was incredibly important for moving the global picture, but also putting, building on Governor Schwarzenegger's policies like, uh, you know, AB 32, which is the basis of cap and trade, the renewable portfolio standard and low carbon fuel standard, also putting a number of new laws in place, um, including uh, uh, SB 100 was part of that um, on renewable energy and a number of others. Um, he, uh, the, the sheer volume of laws that exist in this space is really impressive. And again, Governor Newsom is really focused on how do we actually get there? How do we actually make it to these critical benchmarks that are about the future, not only of the planet, but the future of our economy, the future of this state? Um, Governor Newsom has done a couple of big, 
uh, made a couple of big sort of statements on implementation. Last year put in place Executive Order N-1919, which says essentially climate is not a sideline environmental issue. Climate is an issue that is a macroeconomic challenge like globalization, like automation. It is something every agency needs to be taking account of. And we as a state, as a major investor and asset owner, $700, million, $700 billion in pension funds, 19 million square feet of, of buildings, 51,000 fleet vehicles. We have to be best in class on how we incorporate these climate risks and opportunities into our own investments, into our own spending, because we need to be good fiscal stewards of taxpayer money. 1919 essentially says, let, directs us to look at the pension funds and work with them on a climate roadmap toward a better alignment of investments, toward where, the, where we're actually going with climate transition, and also look at our transportation sector at the discretionary parts of SB1 to see where we can have better alignment. Uh, also directs our uh, Department of General Services to look at our assets. It, um, more recently, and we'll, we can talk about that in the questions, more recently um, the governor put out a proposed budget that I'll talk about in a minute that takes a really integrated approach to climate change. Again, not off in a corner, not, not an, a, an issue for just our environmental agencies, but what the budget says is we have really, really important um, revenues that we can spend in the state through our greenhouse gas reduction fund, through the cap and trade program. Traditionally, that's where we've gotten our revenues for climate action. We took a look at that across agencies and we said that is not big enough to meet the scale of the problem. It is not big enough to meet the problems that our regions are having in dealing with these crises right now and in thinking ahead about them for the future. So we put on top of the greenhouse gas reduction fund a proposal for a climate resilience bond which would invest in natural infrastructure to actually reduce risks from physical climate impacts and a new proposed billion dollar, cap and, uh, a billion dollar revolving loan fund that would be capitalized by the state and would provide low to zero interest loans for the kinds of technologies and infrastructure that we know we need and the private market is just not, um, not adequately funding, not adequately capitalizing. So altogether, the climate budget this year is a $12.5 billion budget. It's much larger than it's been in the past and that really reflects what we've heard from all of you, honestly, at the regional and local level about what your needs are and what we need to do to step up. This is the uh, result of six agencies all of these secretaries, trans, you know, again, not just EPA, not just resources, but transportation, uh, housing, uh, agriculture, food and ag, all together announcing this budget and working together on these critical components. Um, I, I would just point really quickly, because it's, uh, it's important in this region and, and in others, um, the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program is a major housing program that's funded through cap and trade by the Strategic Growth Council. It's actually a good model of what integrated planning on climate looks like, because every one of these projects has to integrate housing and transportation and urban greening and forestry, and all of these different, um, these different ideas that we bring together in the budget. And I'll just go through, there's a number of projects in this region we can, we actually, I'm happy to say, just got five applications for the new uh, round um, from this region. So it's very exciting. Um, rapid transit. This is an affordable housing uh, uh, project near transit. This is a um, affordable housing with bike lanes and, and investment in buses. This is homeless and transitional housing near transit, including bike lanes. So lots of great examples in this region. Just a couple more slides. First, I want to say something I think San Diego has actually really led on, the region has led on, is the reality that natural and working lands are part of a growth strategy for the region. You can't talk about growth and sustainable growth and inclusive growth and climate smart growth without talking about land preservation. And this region has actually been really thoughtful about that for a long time. Um, the relationship between land and growth is critical from a climate perspective for a bunch of reasons. And it, again, it goes to why you can't just replace all those cars with electric cars. We need to have growth patterns that are, that are more concentrated because people don't want to get up at 2.30 in the morning to go to three jobs and then go home. Because people are, we're losing 21,000 people a year in California from inactivity, dying from inacti physical inactivity because people aren't seeing their friends and their communities and their uh, families. More than that, every acre of land that we convert in this state from an ag or a, a land preservation use to an urban use emits 50 to 70 times the carbon once it's converted. More than that, all that driving from all of those far out developments is it contributing to the vehicle miles traveled issue that you saw on the earlier slide. More than that, 
every time you convert one of these acres of land, you take away, you take away the ability for the land to sequester carbon, to pull it out of the air, which is what trees do. You take it away, and then you start emitting carbon. And finally, more than that, these lands, and if you've been paying attention, I know you all have, to the fires, these are fire breaks. Up in the north part of the state, vineyards and orchards were the reason that we did not see the fires go into urban areas more than they did. These are wetlands that are preserving the urban areas around them from flooding. These are critical pieces of our overall state infrastructure. And so the fact that you've been thinking already about how to incorporate natural working lands into your growth strategy is critically important. The flip side of that coin is more dense development where you're not preserving those lands. You can't just stop at the preservation. We've got to go to the other side, to the more concentrated development and to transit accessibility for the more concentrated development. It's an integrated approach. So all these things together really are, you know, on, on the regions. I mean, the regions are where we see, the state sees, uh, sees the front line of achieving and meeting our climate laws in the state, of getting to where we need to be, where we've, where we've said we're going to be, where the legislature has told us we need to be. We see you as the uh, front line of support on these issues because you are thinking beyond municipal boundaries. You're working together. You're coordinating. You're thinking about housing plus transportation plus land use uh, plus, plus urban forestry and greening plus all of these climate impacts that you're dealing with. So we're really um, intrigued by and paying a lot of attention to um, San Diego Forward and the Five Big Moves strategy um, as an integrated approach to these issues and really looking forward to hearing more from you. And thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Ray. Our next presenter will be Dr. Gress. All right, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, I'm the chief of the Sustainable Communities uh, and Transportation Division of the California Air Resources Board. One of the programs under um, my responsibility is SB 375. Um, and as many of you know, SB 375 was a bill passed in 2008 by then uh, Senator Daryl Steinberg. And the goal of that bill was to promote stronger regional planning that integrates housing and land use and transportation planning to reduce vehicle miles traveled and meet the greenhouse gas reduction targets set by my agency. Um, MPOs like SANDAG demonstrate how they're gonna meet the GHG target through sustainable community strategies. And then my agency evaluates uh, whether or not your sustainable community strategies meet the target. So that's CARB's role in third sustainable community strategy. I want to talk to you about what has changed over the last five years since you adopted your last SCS in 2015. And I want to talk about why reducing vehicle miles traveled is increasingly important in today's landscape, as well as progress that we are making, or actually lack of progress as it turns out, um, and then I'm going to conclude with talking about some um, types of strategies that you might want to think about. Okay, so let's start about the talking about the, the changing landscape, what's happened in the last few years. And the big thing is that our a lot of our goals have become more as SB 32 that requires a 40% reduction in greenhouse gases be below 1990 levels by 2030. In 2017, CARB updated the scoping plan to reflect that goal, to chart a path to 2030, uh, as well as getting to 2050, which was a goal set by uh, Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, as part of that scoping plan update, the one thing w that we acknowledged is we're going to need about a 25% reduction in vehicle miles traveled statewide um, by 2035 in order to meet the 2030 target and to put us, uh, Governor Brown issued another executive order calling for carbon neutrality by 2045. So now the goals are getting even more aggressive. And finally, Governor Newsom, as Director Gordon mentioned, is looking to put these, you know, put all these goals in a way to reduce vehicle miles traveled to meet the scoping plan objectives. So these are some of the, the kind of the key goals and actions that have, have changed over the last few years since your last SCS. We've also had side, we've had SB 743, and my colleague Ellen here will talk in much greater depth about that. But the effect, what SB 743 does is it changes how supporting projects like transit-oriented development, infill, 
active transportation projects. So that will, these are the types of projects that are critical elements to reducing greenhouse gas emissions as part of your sustainable community strategy. But on the minus side, a tool we're losing but fighting hard, safe rule, which, which revokes California's authority to require zero emission vehicles and to set greenhouse gas reduction standards for passenger cars and trucks. We are vigorously fighting this rule, um, uh, and we hope, certainly hope to prevail. But in the meantime, that's one less tool that we have available. And what it means is that we can rely less on technology MT reduction. OK, so we get asked a lot, all right, why can't we just meet? Why is VMT really so important? Why do we have to reduce it? Why aren't ZEVs enough? And Director Gordon talked about this a little bit. The simple answer is this. There will not be enough ZEVs on the road to meet that we did at CARB, where we asked ourselves the question, all right, what, what is the mix of vehicles that we will see on the road in 2045 if we change different sales levels of cars? So what this chart shows you is, what we, what we analyzed is, let's say 100% electric or fuel cell electric vehicles, no hybrids, no plug-in hybrids. This is pure ZEVs. So if 100% of new car sales are pure ZEVs in 2035, what does the mix of vehicles look like in 2045? And what you can see is that about 20% of the vehicle fleet on the road will still have a gasoline engine. It will still be a combustion engine, 20% of the vehicles. And we're not going to meet our carbon neutrality goals with combustion engines unless we get deep reductions elsewhere. So we're just not going to get ZEVs alone are just not going to get us to these goals. It's going to, and, and, and I should note that this doesn't even, this assumes we can still require ZEVs. It does not account for the safe rule that I just mentioned. A lot of good reasons to reduce VMT besides air quality and climate. It has a lot of other benefits. So for starters, it um, can improve household income. According to the Bureau of um, Labor Statistics, in the past, households have spent about 20% of their household income on transportation. And the big driver of those costs are car ownership and driving. And so, and a lot of families live in suburban and exurban areas where they're not close to transit and they're dependent on a car. So building, creating more options and building more housing near transit, uh, near transit or near jobs will help to um, reduce the costs that, that families have to spend on transportation. Their investment in active transportation also has benefits for wealth and, of course, personal health. On the wealth side, you guys might be familiar with uh, walk scores. You know, you know, walk scores um, are used to rank different communities in terms of walkability. The, the ranking, the, the range of scores is 1 to 100. And a study has found that even one point increase in a community's walk score can increase property values between $700 and $3,000. And on the, on the health side of the equation, um, if we were to meet the state's active transportation goals, we could prevent about 2,100 deaths per year. And the, the monetizing the value of that is in the billions, ranging from one to 15 billion. So there's a lot of economic health um, and health benefits to reducing vehicle miles traveled. And then finally, perhaps more compellingly, <laughs> especially to me as, as um, someone who drives occasionally, the, if we continue to plan our communities the way we have and we continue to rely on the same transportation systems that we have, we estimate seeing about a million more vehicles on the roads here in San Diego alone by 2050. That's a 40% increase in vehicles on the road, and that's more. That's more congestion, that's longer commute times, uh, and that's more infrastructure that has to be built and then maintained over the long time. So lots of benefits to reducing VMT besides air quality and climate change. Okay, so the landscape has changed from your last SCS. VMT reduction is increasingly important. 
let's talk about our progress to date meeting SB 375 goals. As Director Gordon mentioned, we did an evaluation of this. Uh, we le released a report in late 2018, and the, the number one finding is that we are not on track to meet SB 375 goals collectively. And in fact, as you can see in this chart, VMT and greenhouse gas emissions per capita are going up. And you can see those green dots on the right side. That's what we anticipated the SESs would achieve. Um, and, but instead of going down, the trends are going up. So we looked at, you know, we wanted to understand better what, what's going on with VMT reduction, what are the tr underlying trends. And we, we looked at about two dozen indicators. I'm only going to present a couple of here, here today. This first one is percentage of people that drive alone to work. And we're showing this for the four largest regions in the state. As you can see, for most regions, the, the percentage, which is about 75%, um, has stayed the same or is actually even um, increasing somewhat. The big exception is the Bay Area. They have a declining um, proportion of commuters who drive alone. So we can, we can say that this is not impossible. But for everyone else, it's flat or going up. A second trend that we looked at is transit ridership. So the graph on the left shows you transit service. And transit service is actually coming back to pre-recession levels. But transit ridership on the right it actually shows a decline. So we're seeing a decline in all four regions in transit ridership. OK. So I think one of the key things that um, one of the key messages I want to give here is that Given the changing landscape, given the fact that the SCSs are not performing the way we all thought they would, and we have these uh, sort of concerning trends around commuting and transit, we really need to think differently moving forward. We need to, to think about different kinds of strategies. So how are we moving forward? So in 2018, we CARB adopted new regional greenhouse gas reduction targets. And these are more aggressive than the past. These are, this is SANDAG's targets. You can see um, it's 6% more aggressive than you had in 2010. As we updated those targets, we also updated the evaluation guidelines that we use to evaluate SCSs. And um, there are two, kind of two big things that we're going to be looking for at your SCS and all third round SCSs. The first is that we want to see new and expanded strategies than were in the previous SCS. Because of the changing landscape, because trends are moving in the wrong direction, we need to see more in the plans. We need to see new and expanded strategies. The second thing that we're going to be looking for is policy commitments that, pro that provide reasonable evidence that these strategies are likely to be implemented. Because, you know, a plan for plan's sake, nobody wants that. You guys don't want that. We don't want that. So we, we're going to be looking for evidence that there's a reasonable likelihood that these strategies in the SES are actually going to be implemented. OK. So before closing, I just want to highlight a few potential strategies that we think are worth considering. I want to say that one of the things I really appreciate about MPOs is the, the range of strengths and capacities that MPOs bring to a table regionally and even in local communities. You, you obviously have funding that you can, you can give out and, and um, apply criteria to to shape the kinds of outcomes you want from that funding. You have strong convening power, um, pulling stakeholders together to form new partnerships. You have tremendous technical um, and analytical capacity. And political advocacy, you are all very strong at, too. Um, and through the, all of those capacities, you have great opportunities to try out new things in advance policy, you know, advocate for and try new things. And you know, a big one on the list is transportation pricing. Pricing takes a lot of different forms. It could be parking pricing in local jurisdictions. It could be converting general purpose lanes to high occupancy toll lanes and providing discounts for zero emission vehicles or for pooled vehicles. Um, it takes a lot. It, it can take a lot of different forms. It could be a congestion, uh, congestion or zero emission zone. So pricing is, is one option. 
um, improving transit and traveler experience, you know, developing a, um, a comprehensive mobile um, platform for um, uh, transit fares and giving, uh, providing incentives for using active transportation and connections to transit could be very effective. Um, you have great power to establish and form partnerships around new mobility options for communities, as well as working with neighborhoods and communities to figure out what kind of transportation needs do they have, and perhaps trying some pilot projects or, or other strategies that might meet needs locally. And then, of course, the last thing I want to underscore that Director Gordon mentioned is housing. Um, you know, the transportation crisis is a housing crisis. Uh, you can't solve one without the other. And um, providing funding for or shaping funding for transit-oriented development or affordable housing. SANDAG has a history of doing that, of, of using its funds to incentivize um, low-income housing and compliance with RENA. And you can build on that even further um, to, to kind of shape the kinds of development we want to see. So I think you have a lot of tools uh, available to you. Uh, and in closing, um, I'll just say we know this is a really tough challenge. I, I, we 100% we see how difficult it is to, to shifting um, travel patterns over time, sh reshaping communities. It's tough work. And you guys can't do it alone. You need your local government partners. You need other regional partners. And you need the state. I think Governor Newsom's executive order around leveraging transportation investments is an excellent opportunity for us all to work together. And I think all three of us here are, are, are here to show our support in working with you to help you meet your sustainable community goals. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ellen Greenberg. Hi, thank you. I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, not least because everywhere I go, I hear about the relationship between Caltrans and Sandig as a really long-standing positive partnership. I'm very happy to contribute to that, um, and it's great to be here in person to to talk with you about these issues. I also want to mention uh, we have other partnerships in the region. Since we were just talking about charging, I'll mention we've worked with SDG&E uh, for some public charging investments. It's one of the relationships with the investor-owned utilities that we've been taking advantage of in order to work on developing additional public charging opportunities around the state. Um, from an administration point of view, these are our key partners in working on the topics we're talking about today. So I'm going to be focusing on how the department is implementing SB 743, changes to the California Environmental Quality Act that Jen mentioned. Um, but I want to do that and let you know that these messages are very much messages that have been developed through work with OPR and CARB. Um, at the headquarters level. So just so you know, uh, I'm talking about what the department is doing, about our plans for implementation um, that stems from an administration-wide effort. So um, I know our, our time is fleeting and you have a hard stop at 11. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to talk first about just overview on SB 743. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the potential for project delivery impacts that I think you'll want to be aware of and then uh, talk a little bit about Sandeg, an example from Sandeg. If we are short on time, uh, then I'm going to suggest that that last thing, you can probably follow up at another meeting uh, with Gustavo or Corey, um, because I think the, I'm bringing a particular perspective on the broader picture on 743. So you've already heard uh, about the work that we're doing to knit together actions on these policy priorities, right? These four key elements, transportation improvements that provide mobility and accessibility, benefits to the people and businesses of the state, our climate goals in terms of reducing impacts of climate change as well as adapting uh, to the risks and impacts. Housing, I completely concur, housing and transportation problems are, are really uh, one and the same or a single set of challenges. And then the broader perspective on environmental protection. So um, as, as Kate opened with the idea of you know, supporting a big shift in our planning and a 
transportation future that looks different from what we've been doing. Your work on San Diego Forward on the five big moves, I think that's very much reflective of this emphasis statewide on you know how do we make this work these four challenges and you know everyone brings their own communities priorities so I know it's more than four uh, for the folks sitting around the table um, so how do we bring those together so we're looking uh, at 743 our changes to CEQA guidelines that are part of the set of measures to achieve the goals, the state's climate goals, the scoping plan that ARB prepared, right, identifies reductions of vehicle miles traveled as necessary to meet our climate goals. So that means that we're going to be analyzing uh, impacts through CEQA differently than we have in the past. We have continued responsibilities to disclose impact, select and consider alternatives. And that is going to be, and I, sorry, and identify mitigation, and there are going to be changes to doing those. So broadly, what we're talking about is aligning project level decision making with achieving climate goals while providing the transportation solutions that people need. And the, the challenge of acting at the project level when we've done planning and looked at impacts broadly at the regional level is a big challenge. So I want, um, I want to make clear that this is a process we're engaged in with our partners together, our statewide partners, our regional partners, uh, cities as well, really everybody around the table. We're interacting uh, with different groups of partners on an ongoing basis. We have a meeting coming up next week with the league. We met last week with the Rural Counties Task Force. Um, so at the city level, at the, uh, the self-help counties, the MPOs, right, all of these uh, different groups of stakeholders are engaged in this process. And like other parts of CEQA, Everyone is dealing with implementation. So some of the cities are already implementing. Uh, LA and San Jose have extensive efforts and a lot of material on their websites if you want to see how some of the big cities are addressing 743. And I say this because this is a process. If there's one thing I can promise you, it's that it's not going to be all tidy. We're not going to have it packed up with a bow on it and know all the answers. And we are hoping that in partnership, we're going to go forward and we're going to work this out. So let's talk about you know, what, what is this? Um, so the language in CEQA, in the amendments to the California Environmental Quality Act, talked about the modernization of transportation analysis. Um, part of that is establishing streamlining for infill development and affordable housing that reflects the lower level of car use in those areas. So this is part of, the, of making a stronger connection between housing and transportation by saying in some, some types of areas, housing has lower transportation impacts. Let's recognize that and let's also remove the focus um, on uh, what we've seen in the past, a lot of focus on delay, level of service at specific intersections that has been an impediment to approval of development projects. So those elements are clearly stated in the statutes and the guidelines provide some additional kind of meat on the bones of that. So the statute SB 743 was adopted in 2013. CEQA guidelines were updated in 2018 and those guidelines address both the way that 743 applies to land development projects and the way that it applies to transportation investments. So I'm going to be focusing my comments on transportation investments, but I will talk about how Caltrans looks at land development projects. Also in 2018, not shown on the timeline, uh, Kate's office, the Office of Planning and Research, published a technical advisory on implementation of 743. And in our work, Caltrans is supporting implementation of the technical advisory. So there are these kind of foundational documents. If you want to, you know, if your staff hasn't yet uh, become expert in this or studied up on this, these are two, you know, key elements setting, setting the kind of the parameters for implementation, the guidelines and OPR's technical advisory. So for Caltrans, there are a few key activities that are affected. The first is the way the department does its CEQA analysis for capacity increasing projects that are on the state highway system. 
Okay, so that's like our direct role as a CEQA lead agency. The second is the department has a role in evaluating land development project review by local governments, right? We're not a permitting agency with respect to land development projects, but we do have an established and a historic role in providing comments to local agencies regarding the transportation impacts, impacts to the state highway system of proposed projects. And that review happens as part of what we call our LDIGR process, Local Development Intergovernmental Review. I'm sure all of your staff people, if you work in the local government setting, are, well, are, are deeply familiar. And then there are related mitigation activities, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So right now, our focus is on getting everything in place so we are in compliance with SB 743 with respect to these activities uh, and get everything done by July 1st, which is the express date in the statute. Um, again, there are lots of kind of moving parts to this, and some of them we're going to be continuing to work on after July 1st. So we're focused on compliance. I know there are going to be improvements to the programs, extensions to the programs. There's going to be uh, ongoing improvement as we learn how, you know, how we're doing as we actually implement this. So it's not, you know, July 1st, we're all done. We're going to keep working, working with our partners and uh, move forward as effectively as we can in putting these new processes in place. So just to um, provide a little more information on the LDIGR process, we will be supporting use of the OPR technical advisory. Uh, part of that relates to project streamlining, again, for infill and TOD projects, um, and making determinations on VMT impacts for other projects. And there is guidance on how this should be done in OPR's technical advisory. And again, automobile delay can no longer be identified as an uh, impact under CEQA for development projects. So this big shift is a shift from looking at impacts of development projects on individual intersections to looking at how proposed projects might impact overall vehicle use. So we're trying to support a shift away from what I would describe as auto dependency and uh, looking at the impacts of a project by using different metrics, by looking at vehicle miles traveled, is a key element of that. On transportation projects, the department has a draft policy. And in fact, right now, we've invited uh, partners to provide feedback on this draft policy. It reflects the language in the guidelines that states that generally vehicle miles traveled is the most appropriate primary measure of transportation impacts. So we're going to be using vehicle miles traveled to assess the impacts of transportation projects that increase capacity on the state highway system. For local agencies that may have transportation projects that are off system, like local streets and roads, city or county roads, there's discretion to select a metric that is generally aligned with the policy intention of 743, but there's not a requirement that those, uh, those metrics exactly align with what the department is doing. So part of looking at the issue of significance under CEQA, I know this is very detailed and I, I I feel like it will be helpful to, to appreciate what is this shift, so I apologize for the detail, but I think ultimately it, it's going to be useful. Um, so the, looking at this issue of vehicle miles traveled requires examining induced travel. And in the next slide, I'm going to talk about what that means. It's a new phrase for a lot of folks. Working with vehicle miles traveled is a new, new, new to a lot of folks as well. So I want to also make clear that this shift to vehicle miles traveled by the department is going to apply whether the department is the lead agency on a document or whether the department has designated another entity. This is regardless of funding source, regardless of sponsor. So the measure projects that are on the state highway system are going to be evaluated in this way. Okay, so that's a, a, a foundational point there. So let me just explain this language a little bit because vehicle miles traveled is new to folks. So VMT or vehicle miles traveled is a 
cumulative measure of distance driven. So we can just think of it broadly as, you know, represents, you know, how much travel is there, right? How many vehicles driving, how much distance? This idea of induced travel becomes very important in the context of the changes to CEQA analysis. Induced travel is a term that captures the fact that when, there, when there's a capacity addition to the system, people change their behavior. So it comes down to us as humans and what we do, right? So when we add capacity, we do that often to reduce delay. When we reduce re delay, we reduce travel time. Uh, who's an economist, right? Yes. Okay, Ray and other economists will think of reduced travel time as a cost. So when you have a reduced cost, generally that results in, reduced. play along with me here, reduced demand, huh? Yes. Cost, demand, buy low, sell high. Yeah. Um, so, so drivers behave in this way that reflects reduced travel time by changing their travel behavior and driving more. So that type of change is what we're now going to be looking at. As we change our system, it changes people's behavior. That's an impact we'll now be evaluating under CEQA. That kind of change can also occur indirectly because increased capacity can also be one of the factors that result in land use change. Okay. So in our project review, as we look at impact under CEQA, the impact we're going to assess is induced travel. One of the questions we get all the time is, our region is growing, right? I know there have been some uh, DOF changes, growth projections are changing, but we still are you know, projecting growth in the state, population and the growth in the state. So understandably, folks are saying, well, how are we going to be reducing VMT when we have growing population? So as we analyze VMT, we're going to be trying to isolate this induced travel dynamic so that we're not penalizing, essentially, places that have economic and population growth. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the CEQA framework, um, you may be familiar with the fact that we typically analyze current conditions and then we look at conditions out to a future year. And we look at a no project alternative, generally, and then we look at what happens if we implement the proposed project. So the way we're going to be looking at vehicle miles traveled to assess impacts is to compare a future without the project to a future with the project. And as, as you may be able to interpret from the graph, um, the analysis is going to focus on the difference between those two. So for a future year, if you don't have the project, you still have your population and economic change, but you don't have your capacity change. Sorry. When you have the capacity change, you're going to look then at what the change in volumes is. So we're trying to isolate that. So what we're engaged in right now is work to produce a set of guidance documents for both of these activities, our land use process where we're commenting on work that's done at the local level and the environmental process on, for projects on the state highway system. As we develop that material, there's going to be opportunities for feedback from our partners. We'll be rele releasing material for review. We're also going to be organizing uh, some technical roundtables. We're continuing to work with our partners as we refine that material. So I just want to uh, speak very briefly about how this might impact project delivery with respect to projects on the state highway system. These are real changes, and they are likely to have impacts on the project delivery schedule, conceivably on project budgets, on the choice of environmental documentation, and on requirements for mitigation. We haven't looked at these impacts before. We haven't been confronted with these requirements. So it's helpful. Um, I mean, sorry, I'm going to back up a minute to say that we anticipate that many of the projects around the state on the state highway system are going to be judged to have impacts on induced travel, and that will require identification of significant impacts, and that will trigger a mitigation responsibility. The framing of this is the same as for any other resource area under CEQA, right? There's a mitigation obligation. 
Uh, we've had many questions about whether that means that projects can proceed or whether it means that projects cannot proceed. And as with other resource areas, I'm sure folks are familiar with examples where there has been a significant impact identified and projects have proceeded. That can be done if mitigation can fully eliminate the impact or, sorry, reduce it to a level uh, under significance or where findings of overriding consideration can be made because there are other benefits to the project. So someone mentioned earlier uh, the issue of emergency egress and roadway projects that may be necessary to address, for example, evacuation needs. So that might be an example of a basis for a finding of overriding consideration to be made. We've had a lot of questions about projects that are as seen as associated with economic development benefits. So, and that is another area where folks see an opportunity for making findings of overriding considerations. I want to note, though this is a, sort of a serious um, bar to get over, get, get past in terms of actually documenting those benefits. So this isn't a question of, oh, well, we can override those benefits because there's economic development, uh, you know, positive impact. So those benefits must be documented in the environmental documentation, and there is an opportunity to proceed with projects once mitigation has been identified and to identify overriding considerations. As we move forward, you know, the hope across the state um, is that we'll move more towards strategies that will avoid these impacts. The work you're doing on the five big moves is very much aligned with the set of mitigation categories, I would say, that we expect to see. 